morning, everybody. Indeed, uh, a great privilege uh, to join this uh, experiment and uh, this forum and uh, discuss uh, how to deal with uh, exceptional challenges in exceptional times. Uh, that is, uh, how to manage crisis and uh, perhaps also how not to manage uh, crisis. In my intro, I will try and uh, draw some lessons uh, on uh, what the past crisis, especially the Euro crisis, and uh, their management uh, tells about uh, the present crisis. I will first uh, focus on uh, some lessons from the Euro crisis and then turn to the current situation of the current crisis uh, differs from or has similarities uh, with uh, the Euro crisis. But before dwelling into that, uh, let me reveal the angle or the standpoint uh, watchtower that I'm, where I'm looking at the crisis uh, from. This is uh, the view from, my, view from my office. It is uh, definitely a European standpoint uh, from Eastern Finland, uh, quite close to the Russian border. And you might say that uh, there is a peripheral Finn at forced telework. Uh, I'm referring also to chapter two of my book, uh, which is uh, entitled uh, A Peripheral Finn in the Capital of Europe, uh, where I explain why and how I became an accidental financial firefighter during the Euro uh, crisis. And uh, talking about uh, my, my book, uh, I will start with that. Uh, Paul Gray Macmillan is uh, now publishing my, my book, uh, as Eric said, uh, Walking the High Wire, Rebalancing the European Economy. Uh, I wrote it in English uh, over five summers uh, here in, mostly here in Eastern Finland. Uh, the Finnish translation was published uh, at the end of uh, last year and uh, a more detailed uh, account uh, of the events and lessons learned uh, that I, will, I discuss today can be found in the book, uh, which includes uh, a foreword uh, by Mark Carney. The reason I wanted to write this book uh, is uh, twofold. Uh, first, uh, and let me paraphrase uh, Robbie Robertson, the lead guitarist of the band during Bob Dylan's uh, uh, best times, uh, a lot has been written about the Euro crisis. Uh, there is plenty of good stuff, uh, but uh, some is a uh, bunch of crap. Uh, and as an active participant, uh, I felt that uh, I needed to testify and uh, give my own account of what happened uh, and uh, how the Euro was uh, uh, saved. To give you an example, uh, which is a key lesson of this, uh, the Euro crisis was not just uh, a country-specific uh, crisis, uh, but uh, rather a systemic one. A sort of uh, a domino theory was uh, certainly present uh, and at play. First Greece, uh, then Ireland, uh, Portugal, Spain, almost Italy too. But the underlying reasons uh, were the large and uh, unsustainable macroeconomic uh, imbalances uh, and excessive private and public uh, debt uh, that accumulated uh, during the first uh, decade of the of the euro or as uh, ernst hemingway put it in his book uh, the sun also rises uh, how did you end up uh, bankrupt uh, two ways uh, gradually then suddenly in that sense, uh, my book is uh, an economic policy thriller. If you have read all the Kurt Wallanders and uh, Lisbeth Salanders, uh, or, or any Mankes and uh, Stieg Larsons, uh, you will enjoy this. Uh, and besides, uh, this is uh, about uh, real life. Secondly, we indeed have to learn from the lessons of the crisis. Uh, and uh, I felt uh, it was my responsibility to think through and uh, write uh, what I had learned uh, and uh, to pass uh, on the knowledge uh, to future fire firefighters. Truth be told, uh, I like the English cover more. The picture is uh, 
by a Finnish artist uh, Tuula Juti and it's called uh, Ajopulla, meaning on driftwood, which uh, describes uh, Finland in 1991 when we entered uh, our crisis uh, and it's uh, clearly analogous uh, to what we experienced uh, during the euro area crisis uh, in 2010-2012. On this slide uh, you can see the economic history of the Eurozone in a nutshell over the past uh, one and a half decades. Uh, in other words, uh, you can see the broad trajectory of the crisis of 2008-9 and uh, then 2010-12. Then you can see stabilization in 2012-2013 and uh, the path of uh, recovery and uh, growth uh, since uh, 2013, which is uh, now uh, being reversed uh, due to the corona uh, pand pandemic. And uh, in my view, one has to ask uh, what were the key factors uh, for stabilization at the time? And uh, I indicate uh, three. First, uh, the creation and use of uh, the comprehensive crisis response uh, by the Eurozone, especially the Eurozone financial firewall, which started as uh, the European financial stability mechanism dash facility and was during the crisis uh, uh, turned uh, to a recapitalized uh, international financial institution which is uh, called uh, the European Stability Mechanism or uh, the ESM, which is a very sturdy financial institution. Second, uh, uh, fiscal consolidation, when uh, many Euro area member states uh, had lost uh, market access or were about to lose market access, uh, was uh, important uh, and uh, fiscal deficits were brought uh, from uh, six to seven percent uh, during the financial crisis uh, to three, two, and uh, now in the recent years uh, to half or, or one person. And the third, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, the European Central Bank uh, and uh, Mario Draghi's uh, whatever it takes uh, in London in July 2012, followed by the, the decisions on the outright monetary transactions uh, in August and uh, September 2012. And I, I argue in my book that uh, it is uh, quite obvious uh, that uh, this was the turning point uh, after the most uh, dangerous uh, phase uh, of the Eurozone crisis uh, in the spring and summer of 2012, uh, both concerning Greece and then concerning uh, Italy and uh, Spain during the summer. I recall Tim Geithner, the US uh, Treasury Secretary at the time, uh, saying to me over the phone during the Greek uh, elections uh, in June 2012 that uh, whether we are already beyond uh, the point of uh, no return. And that was quite significant for me because uh, I used to trust, uh, I used to learn to trust uh, Tim Geithner's uh, judgment and his uh, policy advice uh, during, the, during the crisis. That was when the Eurozone leaders uh, finally woke up uh, the, the ECB started to act uh, as the lender of last resort, uh, as it should, uh, as any central bank uh, should. Uh, and uh, in parallel, the European Council and the Euro Area Summit uh, decided to reinforce uh, the European stability mechanism and launched uh, the banking union with uh, quite quick progress uh, at the initial stage uh, of this uh, uh, project. And uh, the ECB also then uh, followed uh, later on in 2014-15 with its uh, unconventional monetary policies uh, in order to successfully combat uh, the danger of uh, deflation which we faced uh, then. You might ask uh, why the crisis hit uh, some countries so hard. Uh, it was uh, an uneven process uh, over rebalancing contrary to what, uh, for instance, uh, the European Commission was uh, recommending to the Member States. Uh, this was uh, partly 
perhaps inevitable because uh, the imbalances were so large and it uh, took time to uh, to uh, rebalance the current accounts. Uh, but partly it was uh, caused by the fact that uh, the Eurozone is not uh, a federation and uh, it is rather only a weak uh, confederation with weak uh, coordination and uh, it was mostly the deficit countries uh, that uh, had adjusted, uh, which reminds me of uh, what uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, said uh, during the negotiations of uh, Bretton Woods in 1944. He said uh, adjustment, uh, economic adjustment uh, is uh, voluntary for surplus countries, uh, but uh, obligatory for deficit countries. Perhaps uh, that's how life is, uh, and uh, please remember Keynes was uh, then representing a deficit country, the UK, United Kingdom, negotiating with uh, the Soviet agent uh, Harry Dexter White, uh, who represented uh, the surplus country, the United States. And this brings me to the uh, key aspect of the crisis uh, and analyzing, understanding the European Union and especially the Eurozone. And uh, this is uh, institutions uh, and uh, the political economy uh, perspective. I underline that uh, institutions uh, indeed uh, do matter to policy outcomes. Uh, crisis management in the Eurozone, namely, was mostly intergovernmental with uh, too many veto points, uh, and uh, it did not. Uh, it was not based uh, on the community method, uh, which provides for more effective and uh, just uh, decision making uh, in the European Union. I drew this uh, almost 10 years ago, this uh, triangle called impossible triangle. And uh, in the corners, in the three corners, you have the institutions uh, or governments uh, that have uh, the chips, uh, have the financial resources. Uh, the European Commission had uh, very limited uh, own resources in this regard. Uh, it was mainly, of course, the European Central Bank uh, or Frankfurt, uh, it was the German federal government, uh, plus the other member states, of course, uh, Berlin was, uh, was key. And it was uh, uh, Washington, uh, the IMF, uh, who had uh, the chips. Uh, and the point is that uh, if uh, every institution only follows its uh, own principles, uh, there would be no decisions. Uh, and therefore the commission's role was to play a proactive broker role to turn red lines into pink lines. Uh, and uh, that's why policies uh, often were not uh, first best uh, or economically optimal, but uh, second best uh, or politically uh, possible. Let me summarize the lessons from the Euro crisis. Uh, first, uh, a systemic crisis uh, calls for a systemic uh, solution. And uh, here I point out uh, that uh, the European Central Bank uh, went through a silent transformation from, from Bundesbank uh, to the Federal Reserve or from Buba to, Be to Fed. At first, it was a practical, pragmatic, uh, but then also an economic, philosophical uh, transformation. And uh, please recall also that uh, the ECB's uh, decisions uh, since uh, fall 2012 uh, also profoundly transformed uh, the fiscal policy landscape uh, by reducing the spreads and providing fiscal space uh, for uh, a medium-term approach uh, in public uh, finances. Second, uh, financial stability was badly neglected at uh, Maastricht uh, and uh, this had to be corrected uh, in order to facilitate uh, crisis management. Uh, we needed a big bazooka, which uh, then uh, became the ECB with the ESM. We needed uh, a banking union in order to break the bank sovereign nexus. And third, uh, we need a better policy mix uh, between monetary and fiscal policy times, and especially in crisis times. Uh, 
in, in order to have a, a more balanced uh, development of uh, Eurozone. And finally, as a realistic uh, reminder, based on uh, uh, various uh, unsuccessful efforts uh, to coordinate the policies uh, uh, within the Eurozone, while better economic policy coordination is a worthwhile goal, member states uh, are still responsible for their own economic policies uh, and uh, to keeping their economies in good shape. And before concluding uh, a comparison of uh, the two crises at this stage, uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, we have a uh, Without, without underestimating the challenges that, uh, for instance, uh, Italy and Spain are now facing and uh, recalling that uh, there is uh, plenty of uh, human suffering now overall in Europe. Uh, I think there is still some upside uh, in terms of crisis management. Uh, one is that uh, the Eurozone is clearly more resilient today than it was uh, in 2008 or 10. The corona crisis is not caused by large macroeconomic imbalances. Banks in the euro area are better capitalized. The reaction to the crisis is quicker now than then, both by the central banks and, in this case, by Germany, by launching a large-scale fiscal stimulus. But there are downsides effect of the corona pandemic is uh, clearly wider in scope. Uh, it's a direct hit to the real economy and uh, to the society at large. It seemed uh, for many like a supply shock, uh, but of course it was uh, and is uh, a massive demand shock uh, as well. And in the last couple of weeks uh, it has been a severe financial shock. Uh, and here one of the key lessons of the euro crisis uh, is highly relevant. Uh, that is, uh, when markets panic, uh, no matter what the, the original root cause is, uh, you have to take the catastrophic risk uh, out of the market. Uh, and you need an overwhelming force uh, in order to stabilize uh, uh, the situation. And the bottom line probably is that uh, uncertainty dominates uh, until trust uh, returns uh, and the pandemic is uh, brought under control. Let me conclude uh, by a few remarks on the current situation. Certainly protecting public health uh, must take uh, precedence uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but the measures uh, to contain the virus have brought uh, the global economy to a, to a sudden halt. Uh, and uh, in this context, uh, both governments and uh, central banks uh, will have to play a key role in mitigating the economic damage. Uh, the immediate challenge is to secure the financing of uh, businesses, especially SMEs, uh, and liquidity in the financial system. Next act uh, will be to soften the law, immediate safe jobs, uh, and protect domestic demand. Uh, and thus, uh, fiscal policy will inevitably have to play a stronger role from now on and it's better to do in a coordinated uh, manner. But uh, a comprehensive recovery of uh, economic output and confidence uh, will likely only begin once people can trust uh, that the pandemic is uh, under control. That's uh, a matter of uh, psychology and uh, animal spirits, uh, I believe. Thank you and uh, very much looking forward to your questions uh, after Vance and uh, Vance has been uh, presenting his, uh, his uh, thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oli, and, and a lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, Vince, the floor is yours. Well, th thanks, Oli, for your super book, uh, and also for linking very elegantly uh, the broader discussion to the coronavirus um, problem. Um, perhaps drawing a parallel here, I mean, I was uh, commentating on the at the earlier stages of the financial crisis and I think probably we're roughly at the stage of Northern Rock and Bear Stearns. We probably haven't had the layman equivalent yet. 
uh, we're at a fairly early stage, and as Ollie said, uh, we're massively uncertain about the potential economic consequences. I think what we can say is that we're dealing with a, an economic crisis as well as a human crisis, which is very wide, truly global, in a way that the financial crisis wasn't. China and India were hardly affected. It's, so it's genuinely global, wide, very deep. Uh, we have massive deliberate withdrawal of supply under the lockdown taking place in many countries, latterly India. Um, one question here is whether the, the kind of conferencing we're doing, the sort of growth of the virtual economy, is actually mitigating to a significant extent the impact on the service sector. That's just a question I, I don't know. But, but the, at first sight, a massive supply shock, uh, coupled with a demand shock as large numbers of people lose their purchasing power. Of course, several uh, governments, including the UK, have responded uh, imaginatively and appropriately with, in the UK case, a big wage subsidy. It hasn't yet covering the self-employed, which is a big problem, but at least there is a recognition of the need for the state to substitute for demand. So a wide, deep shock, uh, probably long, we don't know. Uh, it depends how quickly the epidemic spreads throughout the emerging economies, throughout the various states of the US, um, whether there is going to be a second wave as has happened with previous pandemics, we simply don't know. So probably quite long. Uh, it's also worth remembering that, that this is superimposed on what I think we all expected to be a downturn in any event. Um, linked uh, indirectly to debt deflation, record levels of corporate, personal and government debt in relation to GDP, I think about 325% at the moment, um, but offset in part by the tax cut which Mr Putin and Prince Mohammed have gifted us uh, in lower oil prices, um, though unfortunately not enough of the transport sector is operating to take advantage of it. Uh, now, moving to, uh, to the focus of Ollie's presentation, which was essentially about the European response, I think my first observation is that the, excluding the ECB, which has been very decisive and um, acting as we would have hoped, uh, the European response in general has been very fragmented. We've got 20. Uh, 27 different risk economic responses to the epidemic. Um, as far as I can see, no help was given to Italy, which was in the front line of this. Um, there is quite a lot of beggar my neighbour activity taking place from export bans on ventilators to border controls. I understand, and I may be corrected here, that, that it's very difficult at the moment for lorries to pass from um, Germany into Poland and vice versa. Uh, problems getting from Austria through Switzerland to Italy. Now that's a rapidly moving situation, but the country is acting very much in their own interests. And of course, the British are being far from helpful here. As I understand it, the British actually withdrew from the cross-European committee, which deals with uh, epidemics. Uh, and then we've got looking over the horizon, a potentially disruptive Brexit, no sign the British are backing down from that, which will add to uncertainty if we're pulling through this uh, epidemic crisis at the end of the year. So that's the, the big picture. Uh, in specifically in terms of the ECB, um, the big bazooka, as Ollie described it, has been fired, or at least um, the first shells have been fired. Um, very helpful in terms of general liquidity and in terms of the asset purchase arrangements, which, uh, as I understand it, will allow the acquisition of, say, Italian uh, bonds, helping to prevent a widening of spreads, uh, heading off a potential Eurozone crisis on top of everything else. But I think the key point in Ollie's comments was the recognition that 
we need a better balance of fiscal and monetary policy and that means in practice uh, aggressive fiscal policy because the potential stimulus of the monetary action is limited. Uh, he notes in his slides that uh, Germany has uh, is putting in a fiscal stimulus of about 5% of GDP. For the Eurozone as a whole, it's about 2% of GDP. I would guess that the British action probably is about 5%, but uh, somebody can uh, add to that. Uh, now, my comment on the scale of this is that uh, actually, in, in terms of what's ultimately going to be required, it's pretty small. I mean, in the first year of the financial crisis, 2009, following the, the crash, uh, the British ran up a combined deficit current and capital spending of 10% of GDP, and we're now dealing with a much bigger problem. So that gives some indication of the scale uh, of what's uh, coming. Uh, so I think we're almost inevitably into the kind of territory that people like Adair Turner have been pointing to of the need for the monetization of deficits. Um, the Japanese are already showing how this can be done. Um, central bank acquiring uh, the bonds that have been issued to finance the deficit. Um, so there, I think we probably need a discussion around what monetization of these deficits is going to involve. Is the ECB capable of doing it? I, I don't know enough of its legal uh, provisions or indeed about the political context. Uh, but if, if Europe isn't able to do that, then it's severely handicapped in terms of making a proper economic response. Uh, just finally, a, a word about what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, there is a paradoxical situation of a flight to the dollar, but at the same time, indications that the potentially really big casualty will be the United States. Uh, from what I can have heard from the epidemiological work, uh, the extent of the pandemic is massively understated in the US because of non-existence of testing. Um, we also have a highly dysfunctional president who is treating this ideologically and nationalistically, um, appears to be completely unaware of the gravity of the situation. So potentially a big economic hit to the United States, uh, which we've yet to see. Um, so if, if, if that is the position and Europe is stricken and the United States, where will the recovery be driven from? Um, very preliminary indications are that it will come from uh, East Asia. If the Chinese are telling us the truth uh, about the extent to which they've got this under control, uh, Greater China appears to be coping with this very well, Taiwan, Singapore, um, Japan, an interesting case, a very high density country that seems to be coping very well with the epidemic to the extent to which they are, and also leading the developed world in terms of policy innovation. So potentially a nation-led recovery if and when it comes. So I hope that's um, given a few bit of food for thought.